Afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, Simon Brown here doing this webcast with Markets.com. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, commodities, some FX, some indices. The key focus is commodities, and we'll come to the point why those are so very, very important. Uh, a lot of charts today what it stands for with uh, commodities, FX, and the like. So certainly a lot of charts coming through. Uh, and if you've got questions, drop them in the Q&A box. I'll probably come to them at the end of the of the webcast rather than during the webcast, but certainly we have got time for that. Uh, and we're going to kick off uh, straight to, there we go. Let's start straight with currencies because this is a big part of the story. And this is the uh, US dollar index. You'll find that code is DXY. Uh, it's a basket of current of, of, of currencies against the US dollar, mostly emerging market, uh, developed markets rather, but obviously some emerging markets. And what we saw late last year uh, as inflation was really biting and interest rates were starting to move up in developed markets was real strength in, in the US dollar. And, and, and that saw uh, weak currencies the, the, the world over. Absolutely a lot of very weak currencies as a result. It had come back a fair bit. And the breakdown here in sort of mid-July looked really significant. It looked like it was a massive reversal uh, and that we were now going to continue that downward trend. And almost immediately, it, it started to move higher. And it's now back at that upper resistance band. Uh, live today, it's trading at about, uh, I think, 104.96. So almost at the 105 level. And, and this is significant. If, if, if the US dollar index chart is strong, then two things are happening. Commodities are weak. I'll come to why when we talk around commodities. Uh, and second to that, currencies the world over will be weak. We've seen it in our own czar. Uh, we've seen it in euro, sterling, yen, just across the board. And the point is really quite simple. Um, why is, is the dollar strong? So when the world is worried, well, they run into US dollar, right? They go in and they say, look, this is a scary place to be. Uh, let's go and buy ourselves some US dollar and we'll park our money somewhere there. At this point in time, I mean, there's stuff to be worried about, but nothing really significant. Inflation has peaked. It's come down quite markedly. Uh, it's going to be sticky. We'll get some up months. We saw that in the July data for the US. Uh, most central banks have started to pause. They certainly we saw with Jerome Powell in his speech at Jackson Hole on Friday, uh, leaving the door open for more rate increases if data requires it. Um, but the key point right now is that you can get, what, 4 odd percent at a, at a U.S. Treasury bill, which is an unheard of number, and uh, you're getting it in dollars, and that's a nice safe haven to, to park your money. So suddenly we're seeing money flow into bonds, which we haven't seen in an age. Now, usually the rule is as interest rates rise and therefore bond yields rise, you see money flow into those, and that's negative for equity markets. And it hasn't been. Equity markets, certainly in the US, have had a stellar start to the year. But what we do see is that money continues to flow into the US. And there is, I mean, there are other worries. There's still some worry about general global growth. There's still some worry about uh, uh, recession. Germany sneaked out of a recession, their last GDP number, but it was literally a sneaked out. It wasn't anything spectacular at all. So really, this is a chase of yield. And, and, and that could continue for quite some time. I, I expect, you know, we might even see a move to 106 uh, on this index. But what that's very clearly going to be telling us is that other currencies the world over are going to be operating in, in, a, in a weaker environment. And, and we can see it. There it is. Um, and we can see Iran has been showing some weakness. We've had a little bit of strength more recently, um, but certainly we're we're seeing that 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 weakening trend. And and what's important here is that that sort of just above 19 has held, but equally so as we come back to sort of the 1860, that's proving quite decisive as well. And to my mind, in, in the end, <clears throat> there's a, the, the, the two areas are going to be sort of a break above those highs that are sitting there at just above 19. Uh, and if those don't hold, then around 1770, a breakdown there takes us to the 17 level. My default for right now is I think the RAND is kind of comfortable in its zone where it's trading, but I got to say that index is 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 looking uh, surprisingly strong. And now uh, there we go, the the dollar index is is looking strong, and I think we can see some continued dollar strength. And the question is for how much longer? Well, as long as there's decent uh, yield in U.S. Treasury notes, we're certainly going to see dollar sitting pretty. And second to that, I think. 
as I said, that the concerns have evaporated, but weak commodity prices. Why do commodity prices matter? Well, because commodities are all priced in dollars. So as price goes down, uh, then, well, not so much thrills, not so much transaction happening, uh, not so much trading happening in terms of because you've sold the mining company, sold the commodity in dollar, and then they convert back into their home currency as a rule. And that then typically sees a lot more selling of US dollars. But with commodity prices where they are right now, not going to happen. We saw that massive strength in the czar, what, mid-2021 when commodities were at massively post-pandemic elevated levels. And that's that relationship. So when commodities start to run, we'll certainly see the 100 level on this index get taken out. But until that happens, I'm not, <clears throat> excuse me, not so sure at all. So it is going to be commodities to a fair degree the driver. The interest rates in the US the, that you're getting on the 10-year, the, the five-year, the three-year, heck, even six months. Those are not going anywhere soon. They, you know, we're in that world of, of, of higher rates, even as the Federal Reserve does eventually start to cut, even as our own MPC and the ECB, the Bank of England, the Royal Bank of Australia, as they all start to cut, we're not going back to pre-pandemic rates. And in our case, we're not going back to pandemic low rates, not a chance. We're going to settle at a higher rate level because those pre-pandemic really were still, in many ways, a hangover from the, 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 the fears of, of the global financial crisis. And you will remember negative yields left, right, and center. So let's drill down into commodities. And I'm going to start with the, the PGM. So platinum. South Africa is predominantly a platinum producer. We have some palladium, but not much. Uh, Implats, of course, gets palladium out of North America, as does Sabanya Stillwater. Sabanya has also got some uh, gold, both in their own production. And of course, Sabanya owns 51% of uh, Durban Water Port Deep at the same time. Platinum's looking interesting. That 850 has been holding, uh, and more or less the 1100 at the top of the range has been holding fairly well as well. I, I this this chart to me looks it, it, it's probably the more bullish of the three P gems. We'll look at uh, palladium and we'll look at um, rhodium in, in a moment. This is probably the more bullish of the three, not massively so. I spoke to Peter Radenhaus this morning on my Money Web Now. And he's quite liking platinum, but he does say the 990 level, which is that high from July, is hugely important. That needs to sort of give way before we get any sort of serious traction uh, with platinum. And then it's back to the 1100, and then we start to see what happens. We're going to get some results out from uh, uh, PGM miners this week. We get a sense of it. Palladium. It's back at those bottoms, and this is a longer term chart, so it's a five year, so it includes the the the, the pandemic highs as well. Um, palladium is just really struggling now. Palladium is uh, mostly uh, Russia and, of course, North America, where they produce palladium. And make no mistake, Russia is selling as much of it as they can because they need hard currency. So there's an overswell. Way back in the day, 20 odd years ago, Russia had massive stockpiles of palladium. No one has any real insight as to how much of that stockpile that they still have, but they used to be careful about releasing it into market. And 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 my sense is, and if we look at that, initially there was the spike, that's when the Ukrainian war started, and the sense was, well, we won't be able to get palladium out of, out of Russia, but patently I think Russia is selling palladium. This 1200 level is quite important, and I'm not convinced it's going to hold, which then brings us to the third one, which is rhodium, which back in that peak of mid-2021 uh, was almost $30,000 an ounce. Now, we don't as a country, actually as a planet, produce much rhodium. There's very little rhodium being produced. However, at $30,000 an ounce, this is where most of the PGM miners were making their profit from. Now, your cost of producing rhodium is pretty much the same as any other PGM, and you were getting, call it 1,000 for platinum, call it generously 2,000 for palladium. Uh, those were both profitable, and then rhodium at 30,000. You, you were literally making... 20, 25 X on every ounce of rhodium. The rhodium basket is typically only around four or five percent uh, in South Africa of the mined PGM output. And that that number is fairly standard across the world. But the profits were markedly significant. The profits were absolutely huge simply because there was the demand for it. Now, that demand has come off. Why uh, substitution? 
you know, the vehicle manufacturers are budgeting 100 or so, maybe $150 for their PGM for the catalytic converter. At Rhodium, at those levels, it was just absolutely out the park. So there was just a substitution, a move away from Rhodium into the, the platinum or, or the palladium. And what we've actually seen is some of the factories around the world retrofitting so that they can switch between the different PGMs for their catalytic converters. The, the substituting between palladium and platinum Ah, that price difference isn't so huge. But rhodium, they moved away from rhodium. And rhodium is a metal that used to be a couple of hundred dollars, which is why it was light, notwithstanding the scarcity. And then that price just went absolutely crazy. The trick with PGMs is weak demand at this point in time, and I suspect uh, Russian selling. And then some substitution and moving away. Interesting stat I read this morning on Tech Central. 24 countries now have plus 5% of new vehicles are EV as opposed to ICE, uh, internal combustion. 5% is small, make no bones about it, but it's a, it's a chunky number. Now, City do uh, Citibank do a biannual EV slash ICE uh, uh, report. If you Google it, you'll find it. They publish it out there. And it makes for, 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 for interesting reading. But the key point is I've been reading this report now for a couple of years. And every time they publish it, every six months out, they republish it. And the key thing that they talk about is they say that EV demand is accelerating. In other words, they were saying 50% of new vehicles will be EV by 2050. And well, that number is now down to 2040. Uh, and in fact, some reports are saying even sooner. In other words, EV adoption is going faster than many anticipated. And there are a couple of points on that. One is quite simply that we're seeing a lot more. You know, five years ago, it was Tesla and the other odd vehicle. Uh, we've got giant EV production happening now out of China. We've got the, the main manufacturers, uh, Ford, GM, et cetera, equally all coming into it. So there's a ton more happening in the space. And that is hugely important. That absolutely matters to, to huge amounts that EV is, is coming in. Now, PGMs have also got... Uh, uh, utilization in, in green hydrogen, absolutely they do, uh, but green hydrogen is going to take some time. What, EV, what, what PGMs need is the supply side to, to start becoming contracted. And how that's happening, and it is going to happen, is like with many commodities, over the last 10 plus years, there has been little or no new production being bought in. And that is significant. There just aren't more mines being put together. So, yes, what we do is we'll see, for example, locally, uh, Northern's got a few projects which they're looking uh, to open new mines. We've got some new shafts being, being retooled and the like. But understand that when you're a miner, you mine the easy stuff first. I've been saying this forever and a day. When you, whatever it is you're mining, whether it's gold, coal, nickel, copper, PGMs, you mine the easy stuff first. And then once the easy stuff's gone, you start moving to the harder and harder, i.e. more expensive. That squeezes your margins. At this point in time, there's too much PGM supply in the market for demand. The PGM folks will tell you that in time this will change and that we're coming for, 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 for shortfalls. With respect, they've been saying it for a while. I, I, I am very cautious on the, the PGM space broadly right now, uh, certainly not fooling me with any level of, of conviction in a sense that there's a lot to be said there. I and all, Iron ore is important. Of course, it goes into steel. Locally, we've got Exaro, we've got Afrimat, and uh, the biggie, which is Kumba Iron Ore. That spike up there to over 200 in July was completely out of kilter. Uh, iron ore is long-term. If we go back to 2008-ish, 9-ish, uh, iron ore used to be on a contract. So the iron ore producers would sign quarterly contracts with the steel mills around the world. They would usually sign a contract with the Chinese steel mills and then go to the rest of the world and say, this is the price that you would pay. And that price was around $30 or $40 per ton. Uh, Brian Gilbertson, then CEO of BHP, what was then BHP Bulletin, is now BHP uh, Group. Brian uh, Gilbertson moved it into essentially a spot market. And that's what we see here. At these price levels, our iron ore producers are all vastly profitable. You know, the BHP is probably running at about $30 cost, maybe $35 per ton. Uh, Kumba at about $45, maybe $50. Uh, Afrimat, maybe a little bit higher at 60 or 70. Um, but they're all quite profitable. The point is, of course, this goes into steel. And what we need is a global economy that is building. Now, post the pandemic, there was all that talk about infrastructure spend. 
America passed that what build back better. You know, I forget what the numbers were. It was a ginormous amount of spend. It's kind of happening, but not to the levels that expected. Locally in South Africa, lots of promising that we were going to start doing, you know, massive infrastructure spend. And it's just simply not happening, which has an impact on, on commodities across the board. I mean, copper, same sort of story. Uh, uh, iron ore, same sort of story. Uh, nickel and zinc to a lesser degree. But these industrial metals, uh, industrial commodities are struggling from a, a lack of global, global demand. And that's although we're not seeing the world as a whole tip into recession. There are bits and pieces here and there. What we are seeing is a global economy that is, that is I don't even want to call it weak, it's growing slowly. Let's put it that way. Global economy might do 2 odd percent this year, maybe a little over 2%. That's nice, but the, the, the longer term average is much closer to 35 or so, particularly when you bring the emerging markets in. We're just not seeing the level of growth that is needed to really drive infrastructure. And again, China. China was a huge user of steel. Their steel mills are still operating at about 85 to 90 percent. Their demand for iron ore is about 85 to 90 percent from what it was pre-pandemic. But it's that five or 10 percent at the top, which they're no longer using, which is creating the weaker prices. Good support here at around about the, the $100. We have seen a tick up this morning. It's trading at $112 uh, last time I checked. This is actually the 62 uh, uh, quality. South Africa sells a slightly higher grade of, of iron ore. Um, but the, the price is, is, is sitting at around the 100 and that seems to, for now, to be uh, the comfort zone. I don't see any major weakness now. And we've seen with a lot of commodities where they are, I don't want to say the critical zone, but they're kind of back to reset. They've kind of gone past those those mid uh, the, the the 2012 sorry 2021 uh, crazy high levels. They've kind of reverted back. And the question is, which way are they going to go? Are we going to see them moving suddenly weaker? Are we going to see them moving suddenly stronger? That is going to be the really really big question. I don't see a massive catalyst for stronger, but I do see catalysts for a bounce. And I do see some catalysts for the commodities trying to kind of, in a sense, finding that equilibrium of a price. And I think it would be fair to say that we could see iron ore bumbling along at about this hundred for some time still to come. Gold. The story for gold in my mind is over. We've got that uh, all-time high trading up here, which was mid-2020 during the pandemic, which is exactly what gold is supposed to do, right? Gold is supposed to be the story of fear and inflation. Well, first pandemic in 100 years, gold hits an all-time high. No surprises. Uh, fast, fast forward to beginning of this year, the, the inflation getting really, really hot. What we have now seen is that inflation is starting to 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 moderate in most economies, even today where they're having a tough time. Inflation is starting over for now. And if we look at this chart, we've got lower highs, we've got lower lows. This little run we're seeing now could take us a little bit higher. But ultimately, I think gold is probably going back to that 1680 level. And the short answer is any rallies that we see in the gold price are actually probably a good opportunity if you're trading commodities to initiate short positions on the yellow metal. Look to trade it down. It's not going to do it in a straight line. It's not going to do it necessarily very quickly. But I certainly think that we can expect gold back at around that 1680. It's probably going to take, certainly this year and more, it's probably going to take into the middle, maybe even the second half of next year before we get back to that level. But the big story for gold is largely over. We had central banks who were buying. Uh, that was certainly helped by uh, some of that Philip towards the end of last year. We had strong central bank buying, even a little bit in, in the first quarter of this year. Second quarter, we had Turkey selling. Uh, that put some pressure on it. But that central bank buying seems to have eased. Uh, and now we're just back to normal fundamentals of gold. And importantly, 2023, according to the World Gold Council, is set to be a record production year. Helped in part by the fact that Sabanya Stillwater had a strike last year that took production out, uh, and then two new mines coming on stream in Ghana. So gold production is going to be up. The fears around the world are going to be uh, abating. And of course, those fears can change in a second. And therefore, I think the gold story is largely over. And this is a commodity I would be looking to opening shorts. Coal is another one of those ones which hit completely and absolutely crazy levels, sub 400. Pre the pandemic, coal was pretty much a 75 to 
maybe $90 a ton commodity. And that was it. Nothing particularly thrilling. What's happened, <clears throat> of course, there was the, the pandemic and coal supplies out of China were, were massively hindered. And just moving coal around the world became a logistical nightmare. Remember all of those logistic issues that we saw playing out during, well, late 2021 into truthfully late 2022. And subsequent to that, things have normalized. Prices have come down quite markedly. Coal in of itself, ultimately, is a, an in-game uh, commodity, but it's a long way off. There are literally 30 or 40 uh, new coal-fired power stations currently being built in, in Asia, places like Vietnam, places like Cambodia. Uh, we have got two, Missilien and, and, and uh, uh, Madupi, which aren't operating very much right now, but certainly are, are coal-fired. In time, we will move on to renewable uh, uh, energy, and we will get more and more of that. But there's still huge demand for coal out there. What's very important with coal is that if you want to open a new mine, and it is a coal mine, who's going to fund it? You're not. You're going to. I mean, I don't know that any of the major banks around the world are going to help you fund it. So maybe you can raise some money from government. But ergo, you can see with the Fungela results more, uh, just last week in July and Glovo, um the CEO there. I mean, they're expanding into Australia. They remain bullish on coal as a commodity for many more decades to come. We've just got to reset the expectation for the coal stocks that the 400 plus coal price per ton is absolutely over. And we're sort of settling at the moment between about 120 and maybe 140. We've had a bit of a run late last week. It's continued into this week, but I don't expect it to get much higher than this. And at this point, these coal miners are vastly profitable, just a lot less vastly profitable than they were during 2022 when Fungela was paying insane dividends. Those are behind them. And I want to be brave and say probably unlikely to, to return. So you're going to get a fairly consistent dividend pair. You're sitting Fungela currently, if we double the dividend, uh, you're sitting on about a 13% dividend yield. And I think that's kind of what you can expect from Fungela going forward as a coal producer. Brent is interesting. Of course, uh, OPEC Plus is trying to get the price higher, um, and they've been doing that by uh, cutting production. We've seen some more production cuts coming from <clears throat> Saudi Arabia, uh, kicking off in the last two weeks. They really want the oil price at about this level. So for them, around the mid-80s, low 90s would be nicer, but around the mid-80s, OPEC Plus is generally comfortable with. Uh, Russia would like higher because, again, they want cash. So the, the Russian deal to restrict sales is that Russia can only sell uh, oil at $60 a barrel. Anything above that, they're not allowed to insure it. And when I say they, I mean the major global insurers, um, and they are insuring. You're insuring for, for theft. But what you're really shoring for is damage. You don't want to run aground. Now, Russia is undoubtedly selling oil into India and China, and it's probably selling it at around those spot rates. Um, the other oil, they've got it, they're kept at 60. But the Russian oil is still coming into the market. We can see that by the price. The trading range is around 72 to around 88 at this point. I'm not sure it's a range that's massively tradable, because I'm not sure we're going to get back to 72. There is the other side of the coin, which this oil price is again, and this is witnessed as we can see by other commodity prices, the oil price is responding in part to a lack of robust uh, global growth. When robust global growth returns, I don't know when that will be. We're going to get back to 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 some norm level of normalcy in the next year or two, um, but I don't see sort of your base commodities moving markedly higher. And I think that certainly is going to be the story for Brent at the same time as well. Certainly, uh, there, there is demand for it, but I don't think that 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 demand is going to take us into the 90s just yet. I think we're probably going to settle around the, the, the mid-80s the mid at this point in time. If we do get up too close to 90, it's probably an opportunity for a shorts and sort of low 80s opportunities for long. The big question is, where's China? And 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 this is a, a really simple point, is that the expectation after the uh, conference, elective conference last year with Xi Jinping in for his third term, the expectation there was very, very clear that China was back and we would see China booming. And it simply hasn't happened, not by any stretch of imagination. China 
And we saw the first piece of sort of worrying data was uh, back in April, minus 7.5% on exports. We've seen retail sales modest. We're seeing uh, production levels modest. We're just seeing China not coming to the party. We saw UBS downgrade uh, GDP for China just last last week as well. China's just not coming at the level which which the whole world had been hoping for. And that is a, a worry. China's the second biggest economy in the world. Like it's not going into recession, but it's not just growing. Uh, we've got the issues with property. Evergrande was unsuspended today after being suspended for 17 months trading in Hong Kong. And it immediately lost around 80% <clears throat> excuse me, of its market value. So we have got China not producing as we had hoped, um, and it is a, a a big consumer, but it's also a big exporter, but it's a big consumer of those commodities. So to my mind, I was talking a moment ago around global growth. China is perhaps the even more important one. As I said, they're currently importing commodities at around 85, 90, in some cases, 95% in terms of quantity of what they're doing, we're doing pre-pandemic, which is a good number. But it's just that extra 5 or 10%, which really, really tips us higher. Uh, they're trying to juice their market. They launched 20 new mutu 24 new mutual funds. They banned some funds from or encouraged mutual funds to not sell, which in China encouraged means don't. Uh, they cut stamp duty, which is basically tax and transaction by half this morning. And Friday next week, they're cutting margin requirements on equities from 100 to 80%. They're trying to juice the stock market, but that doesn't necessarily help the economy very much. So China's really the big one to watch here in terms of commodities. When China starts really roaring, we'll see commodities coming back into play to a third degree. And when that starts to happen, we'll see the US dollar index, as I was talking about right up front, we'll start seeing some weakness in the US dollar index. Until that all starts to happen, I think commodities are probably in for a more protracted period of sideways to weakness, uh, some certainly looking weaker, gold case in point, a lot of the others perhaps moving sideways, platinum, one that looks a little bit interesting there. Let's touch on some, some indices. Uh, this is the S&P 500, had a spectacular run this year, didn't get back to the all-time highs. We've had a bit of a sell-off. It hasn't been a, a scary sell-off as, as, as you would think by reading some of the, the comments. It's still up around, what, 15-odd percent year-to-date, excluding dividends. The level it's currently trading, around 4,400 uh, just below, is quite an important level. That needs to hold. And, and if that holds, we can move back to the 46 and it can go further. Uh, if the 44 level breaks, we're probably going back to at least 42, maybe 4,100 on the S&P 500. The earnings season that's just come through was... It was fine. There was nothing thrilling about it. It was absolutely fine. Uh, but it, it, it certainly wasn't a, a knock it out the park. No one expected a knock it out the park. That's not what we were looking for. But the key point is, is can that support level hold? That is crucially important. I, I, I Intuitively, I would say no particular reason why it shouldn't, except that perhaps it has just got ahead of itself more than anything. So perhaps just some sort of sideways as we move to the end of the year. NASDAQ is the way more crazy one. This NASDAQ at one point was up over 40% year to date. Uh, the 14,500 level is fairly important. If you really squint weirdly at this chart, you can see a bit of a head and shoulders forming. Uh, I'm not a massive, I, I'm not convinced by that. But the question is, can the NASDAQ hold? Uh, and if, if that sort of 14,500 doesn't hold, then we're definitely another 10% down and we're probably going down to around 13,000. So I have a different view on the S&P and the NASDAQ, but they're going to be correlated. So ultimately, um, my view on the NASDAQ is more bearish. And if the NASDAQ doesn't hold, the S&P will follow it down. And my reason for a more bearish view on the NASDAQ is that it has been a phenomenal run from a couple of stocks, NVIDIA, Meta, uh, Microsoft, for goodness sake. I mean, one of the most, you know, th those stocks have had an absolutely phenomenal run. In, in some cases, such as Meta, they came off incredibly low levels. In other cases, such as NVIDIA, they've gone to, you know, just stretch the stuff with type of levels. I mean, absolutely crazy valuations in that regard. At this point, the US market still seems relatively comfortable with it you know apple so apple lost set of results was was okay it, it didn't knock the 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 the, the, the knock it out the park uh, but the results were coming through okay 
The point being is that the consumer is still under, uh, and, under pressure. And as the high rates remain, that pressure just grinds and grinds. It's like that frog in, 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 in hot water slowly being boiled. There are some nuances. In the US, when you sign a mortgage, which is usually 30 years, yeah, we call it a bond or a home loan, your rate is fixed. So the pain on the average US consumer who had signed a mortgage uh, before two years ago, they got really, really low rates of mortgage and they fixed in it. It does mean that people don't want to sell and therefore they're not much activity on the buy side either, but their pain is more coming from unsecured lending. But the rest of the world, mortgages are floating and they float largely linked to the, the central bank rates. In South Africa, our prime rate is directly 350 points above the repo rate as set by the MPC and the Reserve Bank. So the American consumer is in fairly robust shape. And we've seen that with unemployment data. I mean, you know, at, at this point in time, if, if you're worried about losing your job, well, you're not going to be worried. Why? Because if you lost your job, you can turn around and get another job with, what, 3.6% unemployment. It might not pay as well. It might be in a slightly different place. But the American uh, market is strong in that regard. What we're seeing here is a... a, a uh, 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 rest of the world, which is starting to struggle. And I, I worry that these tech valuations have got ahead of themselves. It's quite simple. If the 4,500 level breaks here, then take a short. You've got an easy 10% on the downside. Uh, and on, on, on the S&P, it's about uh, 4,380. If that breaks, you can take it that low there from uh, back in July, June. If that level goes, then you're looking for shorts. If they hold, I would be cautious until we get some higher highs coming through. Uh, in other words, that level there, which is just above 15,000, uh, and that level there, which is about 4,430. If they break, then interested in longs. My bias is for the downside, but let's rather draw lines in the sand and wait for something to happen rather than trying to preempt it. This is our top 40. It's been relatively easy trading at the moment. That break there at 71,100 was an easy short. Uh, target was 69 was the first target. 67 was the second. Um, I cut half the position at 69. I lost Monday, switched from a short to a long um, at uh, 68.50 was the entry for the long trade. Target was 69. It was hit. Um, and that for now seems to be the trading range. So about 68 to 69 seems to be the range. And that is perfectly tradable. It's a little tight, but it's a thousand points. Um, absolutely, that is tradable. But you stop either just above if you're short or just below if you're long. And breaches of those. Uh, 67.5 goes, then expect more downside. And if we can break 69,000 and hold above it, a close above 69,000 is certainly bullish and ultimately takes us a run back to 71,000. But broadly, this is 2023, and largely we've gone nowhere and been, I mean, we're up a fraction of a percent, but we've been going sideways after hitting those new all-time highs early this year, back, what, late February, early March, uh, and then all sorts of things went wrong, and now we're kind of trading in in in, in no man's uh, land. And, and so... 68 and 60, 68,000 to 69,000, the nice trading range there. A close above 69 would enter a, a, a long for SA40 uh, and below 68, or if you want to be a little safer, 67,500, a close below that would be a short trade. I am currently long this. Um, it might have closed while we've been uh, uh, chatting, um, but I've been trading that 68 to, to 69 at this point in time. So to conclude, and I've run a bit, but that's fine. Demand is weak. China is consuming, but the rest of the world is weak as well. And China is off the highs and, and off the, the consumption highs. And, and that really is the story across the board. As soon as we start to see that demand pick up from the rest of the world, and from China, uh, then we can start seeing commodity prices start to move. And then, of course, that will then immediately play in and we'll start getting all the other benefits that come through it as well, most notably stronger currencies and a weaker dollar. But for now, that is not the picture. And I don't see this commodity demand suddenly picking up. There's some uh, exceptions, oil maybe, but uh, to my mind, if anything, these commodities are looking weak. And all the charts are down at the bottom. And, and, and the sense is, well, do we get bounces? Yes, we do. Uh, do they break those support levels? 
maybe but right now i'm saying that you know the, the big commodity rally that, that 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 went up into what mid 2021 long since over and i don't see that repeating anytime just yet we do have supply constraints in that there haven't been new mines being bought into production in many many a year but for now uh, that that that's that's been offset by weaker demand Golden Brent range brown, you can kind of trade that range. Uh, the industrial metals covered party is over. We're kind of back to to normal that I'm looking at coal uh, and and uh, iron ore in that regard. They have kind of reset at a slightly higher price. Coal, as I said, the, the demand of if anything in, in the short term is probably picking up in the longer term, probably a bit weaker. US indices, important levels. Um, our local is range bound. There's space there. My bias for the US is to the downside, but let's see what happens. Let's see if that support holds. The Nasdaq, as I said, is up 36% this year. If it were to lose another 10% and to close 26% up for the year, it would be considered to be a rampagingly good year. Just depends where you got in. That's going to matter more than anything else. But certainly, I, I, you know, I, I as I said, Let's wait and see where those levels go. And local, very much uh, 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 range bound. So it, it is going to be all around those uh, commodities. This is our, our czar chart. Lots of, of, of spaces there. I, I you know, the, the rand at this point, that 1750, not sure we're going to see that any, any, any time soon, but certainly we're kind of between the, Sort of 18 to 19 currently seems to be where our RAND is, is, is trading between. And if there's any uh, uh, bias to a breakout here, it is probably too weaker. And that, aside from the fact our capacity to shoot ourselves in our feet, uh, it is. Yeah, you can see the massive RAND strength as well uh, in the early part of this um, the century. Again, what was driving that? It's about commodity prices. RAND is about commodity. We are a commodity in a country. Absolutely, we are. Folks, if you've got questions, you can drop them into the Q&A box. I did see one coming through on on, on my, my Twitter asking about uh, copper. Look, I mean, copper is certainly a commodity that long term I am bullish on. I don't, yes, I do have it on my list. It's down only 1% year to date, which, you know, if you look at these commodities, rhodium down 66, coal down 62, uh, natural gas off 40, nickel 31, palladium 30, wheat 25, platinum off uh, 10 and a half, aluminium nine and a half, iron ore a little bit down, copper caught it flat, Brent caught it flat, crude caught it flat, uh, gold. 5% up for the year and gasoline, which is petrol in the U S uh, is, is up for the year, but this is not a particularly pretty picture by any stretch of imagination, but let's pull up that copper chart. Uh, let's make sure that it's linear. Let's zip that across there. Let's get some more price outline there. I mean, copper's forming a bit of a base. Certainly we're getting some higher highs. Um, this is price per pound. Sometimes you'll see it quoted per ton, and then, of course, it's a much higher price. But, I mean, support here seems to be about the 350, 360 uh, resistance at around the 380, 390. Copper, long term, is the metal. This is the the the, the greenest of green metals. Uh, you know, it's been used left, right, and center in, in all sorts of manufacturing, electric vehicles, of course, et cetera. But that's a long term story. If you read sort of... Uh, long-term uh, re reports on copper, uh, you know, the demand of the next 10, 20 years is massively going to outstrip supply at this point in time. But at this direct point in time, it needs a stronger economy. Folks, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. I have recorded. I will clean up the, the video to get rid of the breaks there. Apologies for those. Uh, my internet I'm on 100, 100 fiber and I'm even wired and sometimes it's just not happy. Apologies for that, but I will put the video together. Uh, it will be on, up in just one lap, let's say, by tomorrow morning, nice and early. Uh, some questions, yep. EJ, always a pleasure. Uh, if you've got ideas for, for more topics, let me know. You can drop me a mail, simon at justonelap.com. If you've got questions, let us know. Folks, we'll park that there. Appreciate everyone's time. As always, stay safe, look after yourself if you can. Look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.